It is good to be here this morning and so glad that you are here too. We have a number of visitors. We're so honored that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Whether you're here visiting family or passing through or you're looking for a church home, wherever the case is, I hope that when you leave here this morning you feel loved and that you feel encouraged uh, by our feeble efforts, as great as they may sound, our feeble efforts to worship our Lord and our Savior. I want to remind you that uh, not this weekend, but next weekend we have our Sweetheart Banquet coming up. And by Sweetheart Banquet, we don't mean that you have to come as a couple by any means. This is a time for our young people to honor our older members. And so please, if you've not signed up to be a part of that, do that. If you have any questions, please see Jordan, uh, our youth minister, or, or John and Denise Tolbert. I think they are uh, working with that as well. So please see them if need be. I want to read a part of a, a song that we sang this morning. It's one of my favorites, but it's just uh, the words I, I think need to be on our minds constantly. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Hope that describes you this morning. I hope that will describe your life tomorrow, Tuesday, Lord willing, the rest of the week, however many days he gives us, because we believe, truly believe, that he's all to us. Appreciate you being here this morning. We start a, a new series, as, as you can see. <laughs> epic fail. Stories of, of epic failure in the Bible and what we can learn from them. I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a, a, some good lessons for us, but... Every one of us has suffered with the bout of what is called schadenfreude. You may have heard this word before. Maybe you haven't. Don't worry, it's not contagious. Uh, but some people suffer more than others. Some people actually enjoy the experience of schadenfreude. It comes from two uh, German words. I had to look up how to say this, by the way. Uh, it comes from uh, two German words. The first one is schaden, which means damage. And the last one is uh, freude, which means joy. And so schadenfreude is the experience of pleasure, joy, or self-satisfaction that comes from the learning or witnessing the troubles, failures, or misfortunes of others. We've all watched the videos you know, of people slipping and falling and things like, and we're just absolutely entertained by it. It's, it's funny to us, and, and we laugh about those things. We've all traveled down, the, you know, the interstate, and we, up ahead, we see the flashing red and blue lights, and we wonder, what's going on? What's happening down here? Let's all slow down so we can uh, stop and, and look and, and see what's happening, because we want to know. And even as we drive by, we're still looking to see what's happening. And instead of our knee-jerk reaction being to help, we, we pull out our, our cameras and we want to take pictures because we want to show the misfortune of other people to our friends and our family. We want them to see what a, a great spectacle or disaster that we've witnessed. We share in that. We have reality TV and and magazines and other forms of, of media that is dedicated to documenting the financial, relational, emotional, and even the physical hurt of others. The, the public is fascinated by the disasters of other people. The very definition of this term, schadenfreude. We're fascinated, we're mesmerized by other people's misfortunes and, and failures and um, this idea of failure, a very the, the lack of success. when we talk about epic failure, it, it is the lack of success just taken to another, uh, the next level, a, a notable and obvious and and usually public failure that results in, in the embarrassment and the humiliation and sometimes the ridicule and uh, of others. You know this this can happen. I guess in several ways, we might, might fall into two different categories of, of how this epic failure in our lives or in the lives of others uh, may come about. The first one is, you know, you, you, you take a big 
calculated chance, or maybe we call it a, a calculated opportunity, where you know there's the, cho- there, there's the chance of failure, but the reward outweighs that. You know, the reward is, is perhaps bigger. Or there's just the general display of lack of wisdom and making a really poor decision when you know the better decision is to not make that decision and exercise some self-control, but you do it anyways. Even knowing, uh, you you know the fact that that there's probably a 99% chance that you're going to fail, and you're going to fail in a big way, and perhaps even a public way. Some people do it maybe to try to make some money off of it. I don't know, but I think those are the two ways. But when we want to approach this, From a biblical point of view. We we want to look at this from a a spiritual perspective. We want to take the spiritual route so we can learn what I hope to be some very practical lessons that we can apply in our lives to perhaps limit uh, the the epic spiritual failures in our own lives. Again, we want to talk about this from a, a biblical perspective because there's a There's a big difference, a huge difference, in the case of people like Thomas Edison where we're told that he failed over a thousand times before he created the light bulb and had a great success. There's a difference between that and then when we open up the Bible and we read in Genesis chapter 3 and we see where Adam and Eve chose to listen to the serpent over the words of God define what is good and what is evil on their own terms and for themselves. There's a big difference in that. In the case of Thomas Edison, we may learn that there's value in perseverance. And there's some some spiritual lessons that can be learned with that. When we read with the case of, of Adam and Eve, we see the epic failure that comes with choosing not to listen to God. There's a big difference between the two. Lessons to be learned from both. But there's a huge difference between the two. Sin is the epic failure of the worst kind. It's a spiritual failure. John describes sin as lawlessness. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. It's a, it's a disregard for God's law. It's knowing what God says on a matter, but choosing to disregard that and doing what I want to do over here. And we know where that leads. When we don't listen to God, we know the outcome of that. The Bible has promised us the outcome of that. There's going to be trouble in our life when we don't listen to God. Sin, or this this idea of, of, of epic spiritual failure, if you will, is part of the human condition. We can't escape it. Paul said, it is spread to all men because all men have sinned. Romans 3 and verse 23. It's the very reason why we live in a broken world. It's the very reason why we struggle with ourselves and our own desires. It's the reason the world needs Jesus. It's why we need Jesus personally. And so one thing that I appreciate the Bible is that it doesn't attempt to sweep human failures under the rug. It doesn't try to hide them. It doesn't try to pretend that some of the greatest People in Scripture didn't struggle or didn't share in this concept of of epic failures. Far from that, uh, the Bible presents humanity not as perfect, but the Bible is, is brutally honest about our struggle, about humanity's struggle with sin. Thankfully, the Bible doesn't shy away from showing us the worst of people and sometimes repeatedly over and over. One author described it this way. He says, the Bible publishes resumes of failure for just about all the characters in it. And when you read the Bible from cover to cover, which you're in the process of doing this year, right? Okay. You, you'll notice that there is one resume of failure after another. And sometimes it's the same person's resume of failure and it just gets, it's just growing and growing and growing and they keep adding to it. And you wonder, what's wrong with these people? And then you stop and reflect on your own life. And you go, I know what's wrong with these people. The same thing that's wrong wrong with me. I don't always listen to what God says. I don't always put into practice what God wants me to do. 
And so I think of people like Adam and Eve in the garden where they disregarded God's word and they listened to the words of the serpent and decided to, to do what they wanted to do. I think of Noah and all of his successes, but immediately after getting off the ark, he plants a, a vineyard and he, and he makes some wine and he gets drunk. I think of people like Abraham and Sarah who abused Hagar. They didn't believe what God had said, but they abused Hagar and, and have a son with her. Of Jacob, who lied to his father to steal his brother's birthright. Or Moses, who kills an Egyptian. Or Aaron, who makes the golden calf for Israel to worship. Or I think of David and Bathsheba and their adulterous affair. And it doesn't end there. He, he takes Bathsheba's husband and sends him to the front line of battle and murders him. What about the apostles who all desert Jesus in the garden when he's betrayed by Judas? Or Peter, who denies Jesus three times? Or the lukewarm church at Laodicea where Jesus has nothing to say good about anybody there and you know, we make this list and you stop and think about it these are all the good guys think about it these are all people that claim to love God and be in, in a covenant relationship with him whether it was under the old law or the new law and the list could go on if we start making a list of who we might refer to as the bad guys like Pharaoh and you know, we could just keep going and going from there. The, the things get even worse. God doesn't hide the fact that his people fail epically. We are weak. Our flesh is weak and we sin against God and we sin against others. And there are consequences to those failures. And the Bible's clear about those as well. The Bible's also very clear about how we are to deal with with the failures in our life. I mean, the, the sin in our life. The spiritual failures in our life. The Bible's very clear on how we are to handle those. God doesn't hide. He doesn't excuse. He doesn't minimize our failures. And we shouldn't either. But He does tell us how to properly handle those. Not just maybe the actions we are to take, but also, the frame of mind and, and the, the attitude and the condition of the heart that we are supposed to have to take care of those properly so that we're not consumed with, with guilt and anger and then we, we don't keep going down that, that path and the end of that is, is spiritual death, James tells us in James chapter 1. When we experience our own personal spiritual failures, not if, but when, because we've all been there. If you've not been there, then you wouldn't be here this morning. You're all, you've all been there. We need to admit it. We need to, we need to come to our senses and, and process that and, and lament our failure. And like the prodigal son, we need to run to the Father in confession and repentance. And Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 15, as he, he tells the, the parable of the, the lost sheep and the lost coin, and then he of the lost son, the, the prodigal son, as we've, or the wasteful uh, son, as we have he titled it. He says that as the son comes back to the father, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Remember how the father responds? He doesn't say, Well, son, you know, you've made your bed tough, suffer the consequences doesn't say that. He doesn't remind him how awful he's been. He doesn't re remind him and, or, or try to shame him because of the actions that he's taken. He's not done that. He's already, the son has already felt that. And the father knows that he's felt that. And has lived in that for, we don't know how long, but for a while. And the father's response is, my son was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. John tells us that when we have this approach to our failures and we come to the Father, John writes this, <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's faithful and he's just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we remember how the story of the prodigal son goes, 
You know, there's an older brother who's not quite as happy about this, right? And he, he makes it known to the father, and maybe even to some of the others in uh, the household. But let's not forget how the parable ends. The father says to the older son, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Bible tells us that heaven celebrates when one of God's children deal with their sinful failures in the proper way. Too many times we're like the older son though. And when we have a brother or sister who has failed in an epic way and we know about it, they know we know about it. The last thing they want to do a lot of times is be here because they think we want to revel in their disaster or misfortune. Like when we see the, the, the blinking lights on the side of the road, we wonder what happened. And we want to stop and, and snap pictures of it and, and think about it and share it with others. The Bible tells us we ought to celebrate as well. Because we have a brother or sister who was lost, was found, and was dead, and is alive. There's no room for judgments. There's no room for gossips. There's no room to talk about this outside of, of what's being done when a brother or sister repents. We ought to celebrate because heaven is celebrates as well. Was was the father minimalizing what took place? No. Was he pretending like it didn't happen? I don't think so. He was celebrating that his lost son was found, that his dead son was now alive. Our father doesn't let epic failures, our, our sin, he doesn't let that define us. The cross of Christ is where our spiritual failures have been dealt with once and for all. And Jesus doesn't allow them to define us. Our identity is not wrapped up in our failures. I want you to turn to Psalm 103, our scripture reading this morning. Read it again. It's one of my favorite passages in, in the Bible. Starting in verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. There are several things that we learn from here in the way the Lord treats us, even in our sin. First off, we find out the Lord is merciful and gracious. And aren't we thankful for that? I think a lot of times we think of God as being just angry and vengeful. And when we've done something wrong, that he's ready and waiting and even willing and excited to let us have it. That's not what the psalmist says. Nor this is the way that God describes himself. The psalmist is, is recording a, a passage in Exodus 34 where, where Moses says, I, I want to see you. And he passes before Moses and this is how he describes himself. But the Lord does not deal with us according to our sin. How does he deal with us? He forgives completely. He forgives completely. And he shows uh, us compassion. As a father shows compassion on his children. You want the best for your children. You want to show compassion on them. You want to teach them and, and gently and, and lead them and, and show them. And why does he do this? Because he knows we're weak. He made us. He formed us. He knows we're formed from the dust of the ground. He knows we're weak. He knows we suffer. He knows we're tempted. And he knows we give in 
to those weaknesses. God shows compassion and he wants to forgive and restore because he knows we're dust. He knows that we're plagued with weakness. I want to give you a New Testament example. Look at John chapter 8. John 8, we're going to read 2 through 11. Early in the morning, this is Jesus, he came again to the temple. And the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses command, uh, commanded us to, st uh, to stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Notice how Jesus handles this woman's epic failure. Spiritual failure. It's very different than how the rest of the group there was ready and willing and even wanting to deal with her failure. They were the ones that saw the flashing lights and were ready to investigate and see what was going on and, and, and revel in her failure and share it with others. They were the ones ready to do that. But not Jesus. Jesus doesn't defend her. He doesn't say what she did was okay. But he rescues her. He doesn't defend her. He rescues her. And when all of her accusers leave, he gives her truth. Now that you've been rescued, don't live like this anymore. Jesus first was gracious to her. And then he shared truth with her. That's how, we, that's how God responds to our epic failures. That's how we are to respond to the sinful failures of other people as well. He had compassion, extended grace, and told her truth. You know, there have been times in my life, more than I would like to admit, where I have experienced the pain of my own sinful choices. And in those moments, it can be, inter it can be easy to entertain the idea that I've blown it, What's the use? There's no way to fix it. What hope is there for restoration? And we've all felt these feelings. But failure, our sinful failure, it's not fatal. Or at least it doesn't have to be fatal. Ultimately, it cannot be solved apart from Jesus. In, uh, in Jesus, our failures... And weaknesses are dealt with at the cross. He becomes the sacrifice for us. He pays the price for us. The gospel is good news for our failures. And failing is not the end of the story. Don't let it be the end of your story. We're going to look over the next several weeks. Of examples in the Bible. Old and new of who we might consider the good guys, those, and women, those that, that follow after God, those that are following after Jesus, those that, that love him and are in a covenant relationship with him, but they still mess up. And we'll see how God deals with that. And we'll learn lessons from that. So that if we find ourselves in the same place, we can understand how God deals with us, how he loves us. And we'll learn lessons hopefully to keep us out of their shoes as well. We may not find ourselves in some of those situations, hopefully. So I hope that you'll keep coming back over the next several weeks as we study 
God's Word together and what He says about our epic sinful failures. This morning, that may be exactly where you find yourself. And you're ready to make some changes. You can do that this morning by repenting of your sins, being baptized into Christ with forgiveness of your sins. They're washed away. We are raised to walk a new life filled with God's Holy Spirit to empower you and to guide you to do what is right because you can't do it on your own. If you're already a child of God, but maybe you've allowed failure in your life, sin in your life to make a, put a, a, a separation there, to sever the relationship that you have, you can, you can deal with that this morning like the prodigal son has. And the Father's just and faithful to forgive you. Whatever your need is, please come forward this morning while we stand and while we sing.